Well, thank you all. Boothies. That's a new one for me. I don't think I've ever heard that before. <laughs> but I will definitely use it in the future. Um, so thank you for, for inviting me, Susan. And I'm pleased to be at the Harry Davis Center sponsored event, uh, given that uh, I think of Harry, and other people have said this, as an exemplar of wise decision making. In fact, I came here from a retreat which in Harry's wisdom he once recommended to the organizer of the retreat that one shouldn't do this as an outgoing administrator. One doesn't actually organize a retreat to conceive of the future when you as an administrator are outgoing. And yet, here we are having had such a retreat. Um, and I think one of the things that points up is the fact that you can receive wisdom, uh, but you may not necessarily understand it, follow it, or accept it. So uh, I'm not going to tell you a lot about research tonight. I'm going to tell you about where the research is framed, how we think about the research uh, that we do at the center. And part of the reason for that is in 20 minutes, it's kind of hard to talk about the work that we do. But since what I'm talking about today has to do with wiser decisions as opposed to smart decisions, I think it's good to sort of ease into this notion about what a wiser decision might be. And so um, I, I should say at the outset, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I don't know anything really about wisdom at all. That's the province of much smarter and wiser people than I. But I'm interested in wisdom because it's something that connects with an aspect of life that is both aspirational on the one hand and potentially very practical on the other. And it connects cognitive psychology to social psychology in ways that most cognitive, psychology, co cognitive psychologists don't think about. And so I sort of wanted to start by talking about smart decisions. So what's a smart decision? And we think about smart decisions as things that arise from kind of ratio, deductive, logical processes. We think about executive function. Everybody's heard about executive function, those prefrontal cortices that work so hard to be homo economicus for, the, for those people who do neuroeconomics. Working memory, you hold on to stuff in memory while you're thinking about them solving problems, long-term memory where your experiences and knowledge are stored, reasoning and logic, the processes that you're engaged in. And this view of making a smart decision, an evaluative decision, the pluses and the minuses, the benefits and the costs, the risks, um, this view largely comes from cognitive psychology and economics. It's sort of a, a cultural idea that we have pretty well embedded that we want to make smart decisions. We don't want to make stupid decisions, certainly. Um, but these concepts of, of the smart decision, they're independent largely of emotion. Like people don't think, at least in Western society, that making an emotional decision is particularly smart. Um, it's, it's sort of independent of mood. You sort of want to distance yourself from your mood. And it's often independent of social context. You sort of think, what is important to me to make a smart decision? So by contrast, I, I want to just say something about what wisdom is, because wisdom seems desirable. I mean, well, maybe looking at Yoda, you don't want to be Yoda, not a particularly attractive figure. And King Solomon sort of was faced with things that maybe you don't want to engage. But the notion of wisdom in general seems uh, pretty desirable, seems like something people want. But it also seems mythical. It seems like a superpower. It seems like something you can't really get your arms around something that comes from classics and history. Um, and in many cultures, wisdom comes with age. And so that's nice, but you don't want to have to wait around to get wiser. Um, and then, of course, after you think about it, you can think about your irascible older relative who maybe is older, but certainly not wiser. And of course, there are always these uh, examples, like Malala, people who are younger and also wiser. And so. On the one hand, we think about these kinds of cultural notions about wisdom coming with age, but it's not necessarily true. And in fact, in the center, one of the things that we focus on and we think a lot about is how can experiences lead to wisdom? In other words, what is the role of experience and learning and wisdom as opposed to just age? After all, you know, getting your bones more brittle and having your DNA sort of bottom out is really not going to lead you to anything wiser. The question is, what happened along the way for those people who are older and wiser to make them wiser? So one of the things that, that we focus on in the center is how to move wisdom from this sort of common and folk psychology of the desirable superpower um, to something that is, in fact, um, 
scientifically studyable. Um, and we start, a lot of our work in this starts actually with philosophy. And the reason we think about philosophy is because philosophy has actually thought harder about wisdom than psychology has for a long time. So from Aristotle's point of view, um, there were two notions of wisdom. Sophia, which is where philosophy, the idea of love of wisdom comes from, and phronesis. And we focus on phronesis. Phronesis is about practical decision making. So Sophia is a kind of notion, depending on the translation of Aristotle you read, Sophia is a kind of notion about the wise person, sort of you know, Confucius, who had wise sayings, but also stupid policies as an administrator. So there's that. Um, but wisdom as phronesis is about practical decision making. It's practical decision making that leads to human flourishing. And that doesn't just mean you know, what makes us happier and what makes us giddy. Um, it's actually a, a form of well-being that is grounded in other people doing well as well. Um, so we think about phronesis as an intellectual virtue which might organize or be directed by, we don't know which, the moral virtues. So from our purposes, for our purposes, from our standpoint, when we study wisdom, what we're really studying, when I use the term wisdom, what I'm really talking about is wise decision making. And that's wise decision making that thinks about moral virtues. And some philosophers have started to actually pay attention to psychology and say things like social intelligence, emotional intelligence, those are forms of incorporation of the moral virtues. Um, so when we think about smart decisions, why aren't smart decisions wise? What does it mean to be really rational? So of course, the notion of rationality has to do with a kind of um, even-handed, dispassionate evaluation of pluses and minuses, of benefits and costs. Uh, but it doesn't often say what the long-term perspective is versus the short-term perspective or what the implications of a cost-benefit analysis are for everybody around you. And we often don't even think about that there are costs and benefits to the people around us for a lot of the decisions we make. So it's important to think about social context. It's important to think about social networks and decision making. And that doesn't figure in, as I said previously, to smart decisions. And then furthermore, of course, a lot of our decisions are biased. So everybody knows about things like the endowment effect. Um, representativeness, availability, the heuristics that actually influence a lot of decision making so it's not as rational as it seems. And that context does have undue influence. So for example, just using I versus we can change the kinds of decisions we make. So we know there are these influences. We know that decisions are not entirely rational. We strive for the smart decision. The question really is sort of what are wise decisions? and how do they compare with smart decisions. So smart decisions are a kind of idealization that we have of certain kind of decision making. Wise decisions might be a different kind of idealization. If we understand that idealization, we think about how to achieve it, maybe we can move in that direction if that suits our goals and, and social goals as well. So smart decisions tend to optimize on specific task relevant variables or dimensions, right? A smart decision is one that you know, optimizes in terms of money or time or effort or efficiency. Um, typically, we focus on one particular dimension. It involves good problem solving. Wise decisions occur when you're satisficing, when there are conflicts between what is good. There are many circumstances where there is something that is good and something else that is good, and you have to decide how to choose among the goods. Um, where there are conflicts at work, that's where wise decision making becomes important and possibly in circumstances where the goods are all good, but somebody could be hurt differentially in these circumstances where people are affected. So we think about wise decisions as not necessarily something that occurs very frequently, not because of the special confluence of abilities and, and expertise involved, but simply because the circumstances for wise decisions may not arise all the time. Um, but it's interesting this notion about smart versus wise, it's interesting because um, when you look at what uh, Alfred Binet talked about as being smart, as intelligence, his definition, which does not show up or is measured by any of our current standard tests for IQ, which he's the father of, his definition was judgment, good sense, practical sense. Well, judgment and good sense and practical sense goes back to decisions that lead to human flourishing. It's about a kind of practical decision making. And so this notion of wisdom, 
is actually pretty close to what Binet idealized as being smart, but never encapsulated into what the measures were for intelligence. So I started actually getting involved in wisdom, not because I do research on wisdom. I do research on spoken language. I do research on sleep and learning. I do research on some aspects of problem solving. But I was approached by the Templeton Foundation um, essentially to, to run a project that would give away $2 million to a group of, a very great diverse group of scholars and scientists to study wisdom. We didn't think this would actually be possible. We thought, well, we might get a few people applying for these grants. Uh, we had 600 and some uh, letters of intent. We ended up picking 23 people to whom we gave the $2 million for two years of research. And it ranged from people who were studying computer science to people studying ants, to people studying classics, to people studying social neuroscience, psychology, and economics. Um, and at the end of the project, the Templeton Foundation said, OK, so you guys have been working on this for four years now. You better come up with a definition for wisdom, because after all, there's no clear definition for wisdom. And that was really difficult. And it's really difficult because, perhaps in part, because wisdom is not a natural kind. It's not something you trip across the street over. You're not walking around observing wisdom all the time. People have different ideas about it. And in some sense, our goal was maybe to define what wisdom ought to be, something that we could shape by understanding research uh, about human decision making and human capacities framed in terms of the philosophy that was antecedent. So for example, we started out by distinguishing in, in the vernacular wisdom from intelligence, cleverness, knowledge, and expertise. You can all think about an expert, like an expert surgeon. And you can think about an expert surgeon who's not very nice. That is, you might go to the expert surgeon because of the expertise in surgery, but you surely would not like that person's bedside manner. Or you can think about somebody who's really smart, and, and she's extremely smart, but maybe not the person you want to go to dinner with because she shows her smartness all the time. Um, perhaps someone who would make very good decisions for herself, but maybe not take into account other people. So if you think about your sort of stereotypes of what intelligence is, what cleverness is, what good knowledge is or expertise, people have a notion of what wisdom is, and it seems different from that. And one way in which we thought it seemed different was that it requires a moral grounding. That is, someone who's making a wise decision is taking into account the moral implications of their choices. And what's important about that is not every decision has clear moral implications. And so maybe wisdom is not going to be called for in all circumstances. One of the things that we considered that was important and something that was not well considered is whether wisdom needs to be inherent in the individual. So uh, Sandil Mulanathan, who was an economist that we funded in the Defining Wisdom Project, argued very strongly that institutions could have wisdom. First off, the collective group of people running an institution could together in inculcate wisdom in that institution. But even more so, he suggested the policies of an institution could lead to the constituents being wiser. So if you think about nudge policies, for example, there might be circumstances where that could help people achieve their goals, increase human flourishing, make better practical decisions, even without the individual who's making the choices or affected by the policy being wise themselves. And therein would be a wise institution, one that inculcates wiser decisions among insti uh, individuals without making them necessarily wise themselves. And so we thought about wisdom as flexibly integrating cognitive, affective, and social considerations. And that, furthermore, could be studied not just by studying the unitary uh, object of wisdom, but trying to understand its complements to some degree. It's also interesting to consider how society thinks about wisdom. So there's a difference, or we would draw a distinction, between the operation of a set of processes within an individual that leads to wiser decisions and how society looks at any particular in, uh, decision and says that's wise or not. So we can sort of think of this as a kind of cultural frame upon which we think about wisdom generally. That there's no wisdom when the stakes are low. There has to be something at risk. You know, if, if um, King Solomon was not presented with a life choice for two mothers, you know, there probably would be no wisdom involved. Uncertainty, there's no wisdom in a sure thing. And society certainly does not accord any decision that leads to a bad outcome as being wise. 
Um, there's no wisdom in the obvious. There has to be some measure of opaqueness or in clarity. There's no wisdom in simple choices. There's no wisdom if it's just self-serving, if it's something just for yourself. And there has to be a balance in perspective between long and short term. So one of the examples uh, that came to me actually from students in a class, uh, I don't know if people are, I don't know much about sports, but uh, uh, Tom Izzo, I think, is a, is a coach for the basketball team at Michigan State. In 2010, Tom Izzo was faced with a choice. He could have been the coach for the Cleveland Cavaliers, and LeBron James was still there. It was like the day before he went to Florida or something. But LeBron James was there, big money was on the table, and Tom Izzo decided to stay at Michigan State. And why did he decide to stay at Michigan State? Why did he give up the money? Why did he give what was going to be a championship team, essentially, and stay at Michigan State and coach college kids? Because he said, it's all about the kids. It's all about my town. It's all about the people I work with. In other words, he made a choice against two goods for one good that increased human flourishing, not just for himself, but for the people that he worked with. So what is the psychological science of wisdom? Well, it's, it's kind of hubristic for me to actually say there is a psychological science of wisdom. But there are a lot of psychologists starting to study wisdom, and people are starting to think about wisdom as a property of people, as something that people exercise. So it's not just a societal choice. It's not a societal judgment about some decision. But we think there are decision processes that are different when engaged in making wiser decisions than in making just smart decisions. So it's a form of expertise. Paul Baltus, uh, who was a gerontologist, geriatric psychologist, studied uh, aging, thought that wisdom was one of the benefits that accrued with age, even as you're losing some capabilities, or at least as I'm losing some capabilities uh, in terms of working memory and attention. Maybe my uh, ability to make slightly wiser decisions as a function of my experience has increased. Um, and Ardell, Monica Ardell, who's actually a sociologist, has argued that it requires an integration of these different kinds of dimensions. It's not just expertise in terms of understanding people, but it's expertise. It's the ability to reflect about what you know, ability to reflect about other people and take perspective, and ability to not be impulsive and understand aspects of your emotional processing. Uh, Sternberg, Bob Sternberg, who is probably the world leader of intelligence research, shifted his research to studying wisdom because he said there are a lot of smart people who do foolish things. And I think he would point to a number of public leaders that you could well imagine um, as doing such things. And so he became interested in the notion of wisdom. And he thought that wisdom emerges from this interaction of person, task, and situation. But of course, for psychologists, we know everything emerges from that interaction. That's not a particularly deep notion. But he argued that there has to be a balance. And so that's very Aristotelian to look for the golden mean in terms of these different elements that form a, a part of a decision. Different scientists who have thought about wisdom have identified different things that they consider to be components. There's no right here. These are, these are suppositions. These are hypotheses. But the notion that wisdom is pro-social, engages pro-social uh, behaviors, that's entirely consistent with this previous notion that I mentioned about moral virtues. The moral virtues like gratitude and trust, courage, generosity, those are essentially connected with very pro-social attitudes. That it requires pragmatic life knowledge and understanding of other people and social decisions. That it requires self-regulation, that you can't just be impulsive, that you can't pick the thing that seems most attractive or the thing that you think is most onerous for other people. Sometimes what seems onerous for other people might be good in the long term. That involves reflection and self-understanding. The philosophers hate the notion of value relativism, but in this particular case, it requires that you understand what other people's values are. So how can you make a decision that can lead to other people's benefit if you don't really understand what their values are and what the benefits are. And that's a circumstance that arises in medical decision making all the time. When immigrants are faced, coming from a different culture uh, with their families, trying to make certain kinds of medical decisions in a Western medical context, there can be clashes between different sets of values. And the wise doctor is going to have to understand how to negotiate those kinds of things. And of course, dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity is critical. Um, so let me just skip over to this notion about the virtuous foundations of wiser decisions. The reason that this is important is 
there's this notion, so Socrates actually had this notion about what he called epistemic humility. So we think about being humble. We think about false humility, we think about humble bragging, we use the word humble all the time, humility all the time. Epistemic humility is a little bit different. Epistemic humility is a complex notion that you accurately assess your expertise, that you know you're smart about some things, but you also know there are limits to every bit of knowledge that you can have. No matter how good you are, no matter how expert you are, the universe is far wider and perhaps has more uncertainty than you're aware of. And understanding the limits of your expertise and understanding the strengths of your expertise is critical to the notion of epistemic humility. That was actually Socrates' notion of what wisdom was. But we think epistemic humility is important for perspective taking. What is perspective taking? It's not enough for me to say that somebody in the audience has these particular goals. According to the way that people are starting to think about perspective taking, first off, you have to have epistemic humility. You have to understand that you're not necessarily right about everything, that your values are your values, but other people value other things. And perspective taking actually requires taking on those values for a moment and feeling the affective consequences of a decision made in the framework of those values. It's one thing to say what could happen. It's another thing to feel it. And it's a very complex, shall we say, ability to be able to put yourself sufficiently into somebody else's place to actually feel or imagine what the consequences of a decision would be for their values. And that means you need to be able to reflect. So in terms of thinking about wisdom, we don't actually think that a lot of wisdom is knee-jerk intuition. We don't think about it as one kind of system versus another system. What we think about it is your ability to analyze almost explicitly about the choices and then take these perspectives and reflect on the feelings that would uh, accrue in those circumstances. But it also requires curiosity and perseverance. If, if these are complex, opaque problems that wisdom is required for, then you're surely not going to solve it right off the bat. It's not going to be the simple answer that comes to you. And so you're going to have to persevere. You're going to have to engage in intellectual struggle. And so the person who's wise has to be willing to work hard at problems. And not everybody is willing to work hard at problems. Wisdom is not going to be found in everyone. And then again, this notion of human flourishing is grounded in these moral virtues. Trust, honesty, generosity, gratitude, courage. Positive virtues, positive drivers for pro-sociality. Classically, these are things that are moral virtues that are connected to intellectual virtues, but understanding their relationship is critical. So believe it or not, wisdom seems like this mythical thing, but people have ways of measuring it. So one way in which people have tried to measure wisdom is essentially to set up certain kinds of scenarios, sort of interpersonal conflict or policy decisions, moral ethical dilemmas, and have people try to solve them and come up with solutions to these problems or propose solutions to these problems. Baltus and Igor Grossman are people who have done that kind of thing. Hypothetical dilemmas, social reasoning. Other people, Monica Ardelt, uh, Judith uh, Gluck, have come up with self-report scales, and they tend to have a fair amount of reliability and actually predictive val validity in terms of other kinds of measures. People have looked at the folk psychology of wisdom. Frankly, it's not clear what the average person believes about wisdom is gonna be useful in understanding wisdom per se, but it does shape expectations that people have about wisdom. So what, I don't know if you can read that, I guess you can. So one of the, one of the kind of scenarios that, that comes up and one of the ways in which people score for wisdom in the Berlin task is to give people tasks, problems. So here's a problem, 15 year old girl wants to get married. And, and then you give that to people and you say, so what do you say to this 15 year old girl? And so at the top you have an example of a non-wise response, a non-wise response to that dilemma which is no, no way, marrying at age 15 would be utterly wrong. One has to tell the girl marriage is not possible, blah, blah, blah. You know, in other words, sort of deciding for the girl that she's transgressing in some way, as opposed to saying, well, what culture does this 15-year-old come from? Is, is, what's the average age of marriage? Why does she want to get married? Is she at, at risk at home? Does she have some disease? In other words, one way in which Baltus scored these dilemmas in order to decide whether the person taking the task was wise or not was not whether they gave an answer to the problem or a solution, 
but how many questions they asked to get information about what looked like a potentially complex and uncertain, unusual situation. So this notion of trying to understand the kinds of questions that people are willing to ask and their willingness to engage those questions is important. This is just an example of the Monica R Delta three-dimensional wisdom scale where people are supposed to essentially answer questions. This has also some amount of reliability, which is pretty high, like 0.8. Uh, it does predict answers to the dilemmas that I mentioned. I'm not going to read these through, but you can see that there are these different dimensions sort of tap into different aspects that people uh, report about themselves. And in point of fact, people answer these things with great variability. So it's not like everybody thinks what the social, socially acceptable response is and they just make that. Um, there's pretty good variability. So I just want to mention a couple of things that we have done in terms of research at the center or other people are doing research on in terms of wisdom. So Igor Grossman, who I mentioned, who uses these dilemmas, he's done some research on first versus third person pronouns in the framing of a problem. And it turns out that if you use first person versus third person pronouns, the third person pronoun distances you just a little bit from your involvement with it. You feel it a little bit less. And because of that self-distancing uh, language, you make less egocentric kinds of decisions. So just understanding that, just it's totally consistent if you're aware of uh, Yaakov Trope's work about distancing and negotiations, consistent with other kinds of work about pronouns putting you into a collective mindset or an individualistic mindset. And it talks about the importance of language in the way we think about problems. And language can make people essentially by its framing or choice, decide things a little bit more wisely. And in fact, work by Boaz Kesar, who's in the, in the center, his work has looked at people making certain kinds of moral decisions. So if you're going to throw a switch to save a group of people at the expense of one person um, versus push that one person off a bridge to stop the same train and save the people, um, people's ability to make utilitarian decisions in that circumstance is benefited by thinking about it in a foreign language. And the idea is that by thinking about something in a foreign language, that moves you one step away. It self-distances you from the affective impact so you can be a little bit more reasoning about the choices that have to be made. Um, it's also the case we have found in some research that just using compassionate language changes the empathy that people have in terms of rating pain for others or rating pain for yourself using a set of standard metrics that have been used in a number of studies. Furthermore, uh, some work that was done uh, with Ali Hortaksu and John List in the um, economics department uh, looking at uh, endowment effect, we asked the question, so how do we reduce the endowment effect? What is the role of experience in the endowment effect? Some of John's research had shown that expert traders showed reduced endowment effect, but didn't explain why. So why would, it, why would your experience in doing trading reduce the endowment effect? Is it because you start to like making trades? Every trade is reinforcing. I can get another trade, I feel good. And so you care less about the objects that you own that you're trading? Or is it because the pain of giving up something that you own is a little bit less maybe because of the impermanence of trades or other aspects of that experience. And it turns out the way that we approached this was to do functional magnetic resonance imaging. We looked into the brains of people who were doing trading as a, as a profession, and we found that those traders had reduced activity in a part of the brain that corresponds to pain when they were doing uh, trades of certain kinds um, at a price that was below sort of the standard market price. And you can always say, well, there's individual differences. Like the people who go into trading, well, you know what they're like, right? So they don't feel pain at anything. Um, so as a consequence of that, we ran a study where we actually gave people money and objects, and we forced them to do eBay trades for a period of time. They had no prior trading experience, and we found the same kind of result. So experience trading actually seems to work by reducing the pain of giving up an object as a trading object, not by increasing the benefits that you feel or increasing your cognitive control over the, the feelings that you have. And we've also done research on things like um, meditation and, and other kinds of practices to show that in terms of the three-dimensional um, wisdom scale, we see increases in wisdom as a function of years and years of practice. This is association, of course, it's cross-sectional. We don't know what the causal arrow looks like. 
And it turns out that people who practice ballet for many years also show increases in, mindful, in, in wisdom. And what's interesting about that is we all have this stereotype about ballet dancers, perhaps, even though it's unfair to ballet dancers. It turns out that when ballet dancers start ballet dancing, they actually are lower in wisdom than the average meditator starting out. But they also show a great increase in wisdom over time. And we attribute that in part to some of the benefits of regular practice. OK, so I think I'm sort of over and out of time here. So I just want to say that um, in terms of the kind of work we do and the approach that we take in the center, we don't think you can teach somebody wisdom. I mean, we don't think you, I can come up with a class and maybe, maybe Linda will add the wisdom section to her leadership course or something. Um, <laughs> but I do think that what's important is that wisdom accrues from experience and understanding how those experiences, what their benefits are, how they affect us, can be very important because we can direct our attention to those experiences, those aspects of experiences, and prepare ourselves to benefit more from them. There is a great question about whether or not trauma and life challenge are the only kinds of experience, uh, given that ballet may be traumatic. One might think that that's uh, part of the story, but in fact, since meditation is not so traumatic and we find the same effects, we don't think that that's true. Um, but we want to understand how components of wisdom like reflectiveness can be strengthened as well and whether strengthening one of those components strengthens wiser choices overall. And then what are the individual differences that lead to readiness in terms of your benefits that you can accrue from experience? So I just want to mention that um, the Templeton Foundation has been a substantial funder and supporter of the center and the research that we do. And that the center members, uh, Ali Hortaksu, John List, Boaz Kesar, Ann Henley, and Bertolt Holtner, um, and more recently, Mark Berman, Greg Norman, um, are all actively engaged from very different perspectives on doing research on wisdom. Thank you. Boy, if I knew the answer to that, I would tell you directly and would have published it in our paper. Um, I can't actually answer that question in terms of mechanism. So we did a cross-sectional uh, study, and we know that there's a statistical association. We do know that there are two other kinds of practices that, have, that we have evidence for taking place over the same number of years that are relatively demanding. One is Feldenkrais. The other is the Alexander Technique. These are engaged in by musicians. They're engaged in by actors. And people do them for years. Uh, Moish uh, uh, Feldenkrais argued that uh, Feldenkrais increased the wisdom of the body. Uh, John Dewey, who was at the University of Chicago oh so many years ago, argued that Alexander Technique increased his clarity of thought. We had some hope that they might do something. Nada. So not all practices are associated with increased uh, wisdom, uh, measured wisdom. Why do we think that these may? We think that there probably are two kinds of issues. Um, one has to do with um, sort of just regulation of practice. It is sort of starting to organize yourself in a certain kind of way for mental activities. Um, the other is meditation is not particularly easy. Ballet is particularly hard. And it could be that meeting those challenges and keeping at it might be part of it. So in one sense, there is some argument that engaged in, in mental exercise, a kind of mental self-regulation for attention purposes, either for open monitoring, like just being open to things happening, or focused attention, that both of those have some positive benefits for mindfulness. And those could have similar benefits for wisdom. But we think that the mechanism may be, and it is yet to be tested as a hypothesis, about psychological self-regulation and the ability to sort of control what you're doing with your mind. Uh, there has been some research on it. Um, I'm not confident in the results uh, necessarily. Uh, we do have some evidence that things like um, 
So we measure epistemic humility that's not a personality type. Uh, we measure need for uh, closure, tolerance of ambiguity, social dominance. Um, and what we find is that wisdom is associated with, um, uh, it, it's not associated with, it's need, uh, tolerance of ambiguity is associated with wisdom. Need for closure is anti-associated. Um, epistemic humility is positively associated. Um, social dominance is negatively associated. Um, there is some suggestion that neuroticism is anti-associated with it. Um, you can sort of figure out what the psychological profile might look like from the fact that you have to be able to have engage in self-control, tolerance of ambiguity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that the big five question is sort of well established at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't engage in any practices to build my own wisdom. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing. So nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, good question. Um, I have not started meditating, and I have not started ballet. And luckily, I don't have to start Feldenkrais or Alexander Technique. Um, one thing that I find interesting, so it's sort of an answer to your question. So we teach a class, so Anne Henley in the center, Bertolt Hochner and I, Clark Gilpin, have taught a class called Understanding Wisdom as an undergraduate class. And in that class, we don't try to teach wisdom, we teach about wisdom, but we do talk about things like economic decision making and how to improve that and why that's different. When you think about it from a wisdom perspective, we talk about benefits corps and why those are different why those look like a wiser corporation than other kinds of corporations. And we do talk about the philosophy and so forth. And we give examples of a certain kind. So one of my favorite examples is to take excerpts from movies like Gandhi. There's some nice examples of epistemic humility in Gandhi, for example. Um, and that makes very clear to people sort of what we're talking about, aside from sort of the science of it. At the end of the class, and this was, a, this was actually a discussion in the Defining Wisdom group, do you think if you learn about wisdom, you'll get a little bit wiser? And one of the things that is really important is we don't talk about being wise. We talk about like getting a little bit wiser. Like You're not going to be wise in all circumstances, and we have Confucius to thank for being able to say that. But we do get people at the end of class saying, I think about decision making differently. Now, we don't know what that means. Like, they could get stupider, they could get more foolish, they could just be fooling themselves. But the fact is, they think about the decision process differently. And I think that opens the door to the potential to being wiser. So for example, I would say, as a practice, one thing that I, so when I was chair of the Department of Psychology, I did try to think about what the impact of decisions would be on other people. So, in a negotiation between two of my faculty members where they were in a dispute and we were trying to resolve the dispute, and of course some of this I learned from lawyers anyway, you can find ways of approaching that problem where people's relative discomfort with outcomes is roughly matched in some sense. So thinking about the impact of those decisions on other people I think is sort of the first step at least as a practice to moving forward. Mm -hmm. Other than the experience from the lecture life, uh, real, real life, and uh, what, what uh, case study or book you recommend and uh, improve the knowledge, our awareness of life? So there's a, there's a, that's a good question. What case studies do I recommend? So I'm not sure I recommend a case study. There's a book by Valerie Tiberius, who's a philosopher, on the reflective life. Um, which I think is a really important book because she's thought a lot about, it, it's a very funny book because she's a philosopher and she's written it as philosophy. And therefore, when I've recommended to my friends who are psychologists, they sort of think I'm crazy for having either read it or recommended it. But what's interesting is she talks deeply about the notion of reflection and that reflection really should be an effort to feel the consequences of decisions for other people as opposed to just list them. 
So you know, we all know about listing benefits and costs, right? And you can sort of look at those for yourself and say, well, that'll feel bad and that'll feel good. Doing it for someone else is really tough. And she spends a lot of time talking about what reflection is and how reflection should operate. Uh, another book that I read that I think had, um, had impact on me in terms of thinking, but, and, and it's Jonathan Lear's book on uh, um, a case of irony. So the case of irony, he talks about, there's really only one point in there. And that is that there are certain times when we have insights into the role that we have, some role we have. So for example, take the role of student. The typical, and this is old research from categorization, but the role of student is typically thought of as somebody who's sitting in a classroom and studying or going home and doing homework, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're talking to your uncle and your uncle's telling you, some, you something, you could either blow it off because after all, he's old and foolish, or you could try to understand what he thought was important about it. And there are times, whether it's as teacher or whether it's as student, whether it's as leader, whatever the socially defined role that you hold, the point that Jonathan makes is there comes a point where that notion of that role suddenly expands, where you see that the notion of student as student in the classroom can expand where you can be a student in many settings. And actually, by taking that stance to those settings, you can learn things that you might not have gotten from those circumstances. And so he talks about the, the reason that I found it a very important little lesson in his book, and he couches it in Kierkegaard and other things that most of us don't want to read, is that he talks about the affective consequence of having that insight. In other words, we often think about logical deductive processes that we engage in about coming to some reason or syllogism or, or conclusion as a very rational process. But he says, there are these circumstances of kind of epiphany where you understand your role in life to have expanded because you have developed skills, say skills of study or skills of teaching. You can move those skills into another place and benefit from it. I think that notion that, that the things we have as skills are portable across context and experience and can be useful in that way, looking for those opportunities when you get that affective charge, or that it sort of solidifies that transference, I think. Linda? OK. So in computer science, there's a diagram that's used often, which has at the bottom of the pyramid data, above it information, above it knowledge, and above it wisdom. And so computer scientists believe that data are basically numbers that you get. Knowledge is the meaning that you, is that, wait, information is the context in which it was collected, so the circumstances of its collection. Knowledge is the meaning attributed to it and wisdom is the value of it. I don't think that's far off from the notion of wisdom in an um, in a AI situation. So one of the things that's being discussed in the field of artificial intelligence right now is values-based design. Developing an AI computer program that will, um, shall we say, decide about the viability of giving a loan to somebody um, can be done in a purely numerical basis. But if you take societal goals, if you think about how society wants those loans and mortgages to be apportioned as societal goals, and you inculcate that into the AI system, that's values-based design. If you give a system the values that society holds, that's values-based design. That goes beyond the way most AI um, works right now. The problem is I don't think that the Uber car that killed the person felt bad afterwards. And so while we can put values into the design of computer programs and move them in the direction of what we'd call wisdom, at this point in time, we don't have a good way of making those programs feel the value consequences of certain kinds of decisions. Linda? Yeah. 
So that's a great question. Um, the definition is the definition of taught is the is the vernacular issue under consideration, not the definition of wisdom. So the definition of wisdom, Aristotle's definition is simply practical decision making that leads to human flourishing, where human flourishing means there are implications for other people's well-being in terms of what your well-being should be. Well, the, the definition, I gave you the little snippets of it. The definition is like a page long with a page preamble to it as context. <laughs> but the, gist is the, gist is, the gist is Aristotle. So uh, were I to, you know, if, if Candace Vogler were here from the philosophy department, she would be nudging me about Thomas Aquinas. Um, I think those kinds of distinctions are more subtle than we need. I think that human, I think the issue about what human flourishing is is tricky, but the notion of practical decision making where those implications occur is, is the clearest definition. Why can't it be taught? Because I don't think you can tell people how to feel. Yeah, I don't think you can tell people to feel something. I can't tell you to feel bad about this. I can tell you what somebody might feel, and that won't let you feel what they feel. And so the argument that I would make is, the, way, the pedagogical model for teaching that we hold to in a university, which is a kind of didactic model, is not lending itself to the circumstances that could convey to an individual the experiences necessary to engage in sort of perspective taking or evaluation, uh, evaluate, to feel the things that they need to feel. which is why I think it can be learned and not taught. So that the definition of teaching here is a, a very narrow and circumscribed one, which is not all things. So if you ask me, the, ask me the following question, could you craft a kind of set of situations that you could put people in where those situations would lead to wiser decision making at the end of the chain of, I would argue, yes, you could. And then we could call that teaching. Oh, sorry. So, um, what do you think about decisions that, let's say, you, you, you know smart decision, you know the, the wiser decision, but it does not feel like the right decision? I'm thinking about things that are very emotionally involved, so like going on a, like taking on a long distance relationship or investing in your startup idea, like that's just, you know you're in debt, you know it's going to be very problematic, but you know not to make a decision I think that's, so that's really interesting question because it, one of the, so wisdom, here's the problem. The problem is it doesn't feel right. What does that mean? What is the source of that not feeling right? And is that knowable? So the argument for wisdom would be to reflect on that and to try to come to some understanding of what that means. It could be because it violates some values that are important, but it could be because of a fear that you're not going to achieve some goal in spite of knowing other things. So I think that the answer to those kinds of conflicts are where reflection becomes critical. One of the things that has been emphasized a lot in recent years in, in psychology is a kind of intuitive decision making. So there's a notion that uh, John Haidt has of what's called moral dumbfounding, right? And it's, it's a little bit like the notion that you're sort of getting at. So for example, uh, if I told you that uh, the family dog was just killed, we're gonna have him for dinner, you know, everybody thinks that's a bad thing, nobody's gonna be happy about it. But if you go and list the objections, well, whatever, you know, we have an emotional attachment. If you went through a series of responses to those, encountered all of them, which is what Haidt does in some of his research, and you still don't want to do it, like, you know, um, he had one case of, uh, one example of incest between a brother and sister who were consenting adults, who were using birth control, who were well aware of whatever, who, you know, they're like, all the objections were met. 
the school board where he wanted to do the study and ask the questions, he could not convince them to let him do the study. These notions, what happens is after you unpack all the verbalizable and sort of realizable reasons, when you get down to the core bottom and you can't unpack it anymore, that's what Haidt calls moral dumbfounding. For him, there's no penetration there. But the hypothesis that we have, or at least the hypothesis that some philosophers have that might have psychological reality, is maybe you could know, but you would need to do a different kind of thinking. And so the question would be, how would you think about those things where you have strong affective responses on the one side and a set of cognitive, shall we say, balance sheet analyses on the other side? And how do you put those things together? And the answer is going to be to try to understand yourself. And there may be, in that moment for that decision, no way to make a wise decision. But it may be that after you make this decision, you see what the consequences are, and you learn from that experience that the next time something occurs like that, you have a basis to go back and unpack it. So the, there are four, so in terms of intelligence tests, I think they measure the definition of, of intelligence that has been used to predict, putatively predict performance in certain circumstances. I don't think it necessarily measures smarts, and that I take from Bob Sternberg's research about intelligence. That is, you know, what is intelligent in the city of Chicago is not intelligent um, in Bombay, in Mumbai, for example. Um, what is intelligent in Hong Kong is not intelligent in London. There's overlap, but they're not identical. Um, if you have a certain kind of disease, it doesn't make you less smart, but your performance on the test will be less good. So intelligence tests are flawed. All tests are assessment vehicles subject to the state of the test taker and so forth and so on. But intelligence is a construct. Intelligence isn't a thing. You know, it's not a kind of mineral and it's not an element in the world. It's a construct. And as a psychological construct, the tests that we have to measure it reflect the theories that we have about intelligence. In much the same way, the tests or tasks to measure wisdom reflect the kinds of theories that people have about wisdom. So I mentioned Monica Ardell's three-dimensional wisdom scale. Uh, there's a paper by Judith Gluck in Frontiers in Psychology, I think it is, where she compares a number of the different self-report measures for wisdom. There's like eight, seven, something like that. They tend to have reasonable reliability. They tend to not be strongly uh, influenced by social desirability, although there is some influence. Uh, Monica Ardelt is as good as any, and then there's a short version called the Quick Wisdom Scale, I think uh, Gluck calls it which she's developed, which is like seven questions or 10 questions or something. So there are a couple of self-report skills that are reasonably good. Igor Grossman's um, scenarios are also quite good. They have good predictive reliability and good, um, a good validity with other kinds of measures, including peer nominations. So one of the ways that you can sort of assess this is you can say, let's say you wanna say, who are the wisest people who are leaders in business today, as opposed to all the smart business leaders, if that distinction could be made. You get a bunch of top business leaders to nominate the wisest, and then you get that list and then you go out and give them some of these tests, and you see if the wise versus the smart is distinguished on the basis of this test. And so Igor has done that kind of peer nomination and validity of his test. Um, Paul Baltus's Berlin paradigm also has a fair amount of uh, validity. So those are the four that, the short scale that Gluck has, the three-dimensional wisdom scale from Ardeld, Igor Grossman's uh, social reasoning, and the Baltus.